question about what we discussed last week? Sure. Okay. Um, there was we talked about this debate about whether or not uh, Isaiah was talking about Abraham or was talking about uh, Cyrus. Cyrus, but wasn't uh, Isaiah like a couple hundred years before Cyrus? Um. Yeah. So this was actually a, a, a prophet. He was prophesizing this person that was going to come in the future and do this. Is, actually, isn't he? Isn't he a prophet? Yeah. <laughs> Prophecies, I thought, were usually about you know the Jewish people. The land was okay. Isaiah, so... Isaiah lived. Let's just put this into perspective. Hear me out. He was during the first temple period, right? You give his exact years. Good old internet toward toward the end of the first temple. Or is the end is correct, but not like as far not like Yirmiyahu lives after Isaiah. Mm -hmm. So earlier. Um so the the Koresh Koresh's rule is you know um was even after Koresh yeah Babylonia right yeah but that yeah. doesn't that doesn't bother us meaning it's a prophecy prophets prophets play two roles one is they help they help direct world events towards uh, religious impl inclination of like what they're what they're about. That's what this is. Um, so Yechaskel says this is about me he ir me misrach that this is know that Koresh is going to come and don't think that it's Koresh on his own, but God sent it. God, God, and what better way to make that message than by saying it a hundred years before it happens? Right. Mm. But the reason why I was asking is only is that. You know, as a prophet, and he's prophesizing to, uh, you know, to, I guess both the, uh, I guess just uh, Judea, is a prophecy about someone in the future going to mean anything to the people at the time. It it will, it will in that it refers to a redemption, that the redemption will come, and don't think that redemption comes at the hands of just the random person who's saving you um but meaning uh, you're asking an interesting question what did the person who heard isaiah's uh prophecy understand in that moment right yeah and the, the answer could be maybe they did think about abraham and really it had a deeper meaning um it could mean maybe it was general. They didn't know who it was going to be, but they knew that someone would come and redeem them. And that wasn't going to be uh, just random, but that was sent by God. Both okay. of those are options. That's comforting. Yeah. Yeah. All okay. right. That is my question. Okay. Power of Torah this week is from Milachim, from Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 37. It's a long half Torah. Um, hold on. Pull that. So Malachim Bet four one through thirty seven, um, and really it consists of two stories. We are in the time period of the prophet of Elisha. Elisha is sorry. No, Elisha no. is Elijah's protege. Yeah. So we're talking about Elijah. I'm sorry. It's a disciple of Elijah. Yeah, yeah, he's Elijah's yeah. protege. We're talking about you know mid, like the 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 first the end of the first half of the second temple. First half, the end of the first half of the second temple. But wasn't didn't Elisha also prophesy to the northern kingdom? Um, did I say second temple? I meant first temple. Excuse oh, me. First, yeah. First temple. First temple. We don't have prophets from the second temple like that. 
Yeah, my, my apologies. Thank you. Good catch there. Um, and we get two stories. And, and the, the stories, there are really multiple storylines that go carry through this Haftor. There are two stories. One is about one of the wives of the B'nai Hanavi'im, of the children, of the wives of the of the prophets. Um, and that uh, she has no money and uh, she's losing her children. And uh, basically he does this miracle for her that they get they get oil. The oil continues to go until they fill all of their kalim. And then they sell that and they make all, they make the money. The second is the introduction to the famous story of the Isha Shunamit, the woman from Shunam, where she becomes one of like Alicia's uh, stops. And Alicia makes a promise to her, you'll have a child. Um, and the child dies. And uh, she goes to, the, to Alicia to force him to um, revive the child. And he ultimately does. That's, this, that's a very basic outline. Um, and there are really two through lines here. One is about the women in the story. And the other is about Alicia in the story. And they're different narratives or different perspectives, meaning part of this is wrestling with or we're observing a transition about prophecy. Prophets and what the prophets do change at a certain point. Um, and Alicia being the end of that, of that, of that thing. Until Alicia, right? Alicia is the, the magician, the prophet who pulls out great miracles. You know, you need more money? Don't worry, I'm going to make the oil keep flowing. That's not, Ishayahu doesn't do anything like that. Yermiyahu doesn't do anything that, like that. Yechesko doesn't do anything like that, right? They are more talking about rebuking the people, giving people visions of the future. Not that there aren't miracles, but they aren't miracles that help you, right? Um, they're not about helping the moment. They're about conveying rhetoric and uh, their rhetorical device. Um, and that's that's a big change. The prophet goes from... Uh, a magician in residence, sort of connected to God's pulse, to like a, a mashkiach, someone who tells you about when you're doing something wrong, like a communal conscience. Um, and so we observe that change in this Torah. The other part of this is also um, the role of the women involved. Um, in particular, the famous Isha Shunamit, the famous woman from Shunam, who is promised a child, um, who is barren, um, who uses the same language as the uh, Parsha has, right? Um, uh, Alicia, basically, if you look at chapter, in this chapter six, by he, uh, no, that's not the right one, verse so it's chapter four, excuse me, but it's verse verse eight. This is where the second story starts. Vaya Hayom. And it was on the day that Elisha visited Shunam. And there there was a wealthy woman and man. Um and uh she would she intrigued Elijah uh Alicia to stay with her, and she made him a little comfortable residence. Um, and Alicia wanted to do something for her. And so Alicia asked his uh, agent, his servant, Gehazi, who ultimately becomes disgraced, um, do, you know, what can I do for her? And he says she doesn't have a child. So verse 15, by Yomer Umala Sotla, what can I do for her? By Yomer Gehazi, Gehazi says, Aval ben Ainla, the Isha Zakain. She has no son, and her husband is old. By the way, this is very reminiscent about our Parsha, Avraham Zakain, yeah. Baba Yamim, right? Um, but you know, yeah. and, and in our Parsha, Vadoni Zakain, that Avraham is very old. But Yomer know, Krala, Alicia calls her, Vayomerkrala, and she called to him, Vatamo Abapetah, and she stood in the doorway, Vayomer Lamoit, Hazo, Haze, Kaet Chaya, Vat Choveket Ben. That at this time, next season, or this season, next time, next year, you'll have a child. By the way, that's exactly what our Parsha says, right? Um, our Parsha says, Ka'it chaya sarben, right? That she'll have the same language, Ka'it chaya, the season change. What does Sarah say when she hears that she's going to have a child? Okay, I'm, not, I'm she, 99 years she old. Laughs. She laughs. Oh, she laughs. She laughs. Yeah, she laughs. Yeah. 
Vataraisha, I'm sorry. Uh, what did she say? Vayomer, what did she say? Vatomer al Adoni. She says to her, to the to the prophet, Ish Ha'elokim, the oh great prophet of God. Don't make fun of me. Don't delude me. I don't believe you. Right? Again, very, very similar parallel to that. Um, so what happens in all of this? This is part of the question that, that, that comes up. Um, um, and so there's a whole through line here about what's the role of the women? What's, what, what she, what she, uh, what, 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 what's, um, you know, what, what's her role in this? Um, and there, there are similarities and differences to the Parsha, um, about like, is she excited about this? Does it work? Does it not? All of that, those different pieces. Um, and this, this really ushers in a broader question. Like what is the role of the barren woman in this scenario? Um, uh, what, you know, we have that over and over again throughout the, throughout the Torah, we have this theme of barren women, right? What, what role does that play? What are we, what's the Torah trying to highlight that? So there are different, there are different answers of, to that, right? I think that's a theme that the Haftorah is clearly highlighting in the Parsha story, right? We're, we're, we're highlighting two mothers in the Parsha, in the Haftorah, um, who potentially lose their children, and one who didn't have children, who gets a promised child just like Sarah. And by the way, the same thing happens in our Parsha. We have two children, one that gets banished, and one that almost gets sacrificed, right? So the Torah is a really nice mirror to the Parsha. Uh, what, what's the point in this? What are we trying to learn about this? So some make the point, like Rav Meidan, Rav Yaakov Meidan, that this is about faith and this is about kindness. That kindness is the first part here, that God provides kindness that, that they will have a child. Um, and then faith that even in moments of turbulence that things will be okay, right? Uh, and let's just go through this. Yishmael is the child. That's kindness to Abraham. He doesn't have any errors. Yishmael, uh, Hagar runs away the first time. Hagar is expelled the second time. There's fear. Is Yishmael going to survive? And there's faith that God will have Yishmael survive. Right? That's what Abraham, that's what God tells Abraham. And uh, and and that and that that plays out. Same thing with Yitzchak. Yitzchak is born this week's Parsha. Kindness of God to Abraham and Sarah, even though of their advanced age. And question that is Abraham, is Yitzchak going to survive? And ultimately, God shows that God, you know, uh, commands to protect Yitzchak. God put Yitzchak in that situation to be with. But the point is all the setup to save Yitzchak, right? So maybe that's what's going on here. Our half Torah is the same thing, right? You have these women, this mother who's going to lose her children to debtors, and the prophet says, "Don't worry about it. You had faith as a, you had, you had. I'm sorry. According to the midrash, who is this woman in the first story? This is uh, Ovadia's wife, okay. who okay. saved the prophets. She yeah. showed kindness." in the early parts of this and had faith in the prophet when she was stuck. She didn't just like go curse God. She went to the prophet and said, I need help. She had faith. And ultimately that pays off this, uh, 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 Isha Shunami. She shows kindness to Alicia and then ultimately shows faith that God will take care of her after promise being promised a child that the child will survive. So you have a little bit of that. And there, there are a lot of pieces here, right? Where does she see Alicia? She sees him on Har Carmel, right? Where does Yitzchak go, go to Har Hamoria, right? Har Carmel is also a place where God has divine sacrifice. Remember, Alicia challenges the Nivea Habal. And uh, water, yeah. Exactly. That happens on Har Carmel. So the. There are a lot of connections here. And the question is, like, what about the slight nuances? The kindness that God shows Sarah and Avram is mirrored not by God showing kindness to uh, Isha Shunami, but the Isha Shunami showing kindness to the prophet, right? So maybe that's even like uh, the next step of the story, that God doesn't 
need to innovate kindness in the world. Humanity can. Or you could line it up better, right? Abraham welcomes a visitor into his tent. The angels, they turn around and return that kindness with a promise from God of ultimate kindness to have children. And mm. then that child is put at risk. And ultimately, faith in God is what saves the child. The Avram, the Avram Yitzhak Ark. And then what happens in our parsha? Isha Shunami starts by welcoming an agent of God, a Malach, right? A leash, a Malach doesn't have to be an angel, it could just be a messenger. And the, the prophet's a messenger of God. She welcomes a messenger of God, hospitality. That is returned with kindness from the Almighty, which then needs to be saved through faith in God by going to Elisha to save the child. And ultimately, the, so there are a number of these very strong parallels, right? And you can really trace it out. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, it is. Yeah, what? Lee? No, I said it is unbelievable. Oh, so that, that, that's part of it. Now, what else is in this barren mother's motif, right? That is a strong motif. What are times where we see barren mothers in the Torah? Well, there's um, Rivka. Rivka, Rivka, Rachel. Rivka, Rachel. Rivka, Rachel. By the way, we'll give Leah partial credit, right? She realizes um, that she's Amod Miledet, that she stops giving birth, and that's where Bill and Zilpa join the Jewish community. That's true. Yeah. 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 Chana, thank oh, you. Chana, Chana with Shmuel, yeah. yeah. Who, who's before Chana? Also, uh, Shosan? I'm sorry, who? Why, I'm asking you, who else before Chana? Their child also starts with a Sh sound. Shimshon's mother, right? Oh, Shimshon, Shem right. Shimshon. <laughs> yeah, and Shmuel, too. Shmuel. And then we have Isha Shunamit here. Yeah. So there are a lot of these, a lot of this motif. So what it, and, and there are a lot of parallels, right? Husbands being old, husbands caring a lot, right? Yitzchak, Yaakov, Elkanah, all have so have shown so much love and even suggest that their husbandly love may even take the place of children, right? That's a motif that all three of them say. Maybe it just shows that Jewish men were embedded to be a little bit insensitive. Um, um, <laughs> Um, the motif of having a maid join Lee takes offense. I'm sorry, Lee. I'm <laughs> um, the idea of a maid, a maid being added in as a potential surrogate, right? You have that with Hagar, you have that with Rachel, you have that with Leah. Um, mm. uh, also, you know, because uh, wasn't there Panina who had many, many Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, and if we throw in oh. not a maid, but as a second wife, so you have Pina also. Um, and by the way, if we see, this might be heretical. I, I'm not necessarily committing to this idea. But if <laughs> we see the development of Jewish history as progress also, meaning that the Avot were great leaders, but they make some mistakes, and we perpetuate, we're able to uh, perhaps move, move the needle, right? Yitzchak and Yishmael don't work out. Yaakov and Esav don't work out. But all of Yaakov's children are B'nai Yisrael, right? So we reach a point where that's the case. Um, uh, Avram and Sarah's relationship is different than Yitzchak and Rivka's relationship. Um, and Yaakov and Rachel's relationship. So there's a progression there. If we understand that, right? So... Um, the idea that the Isha Shunami doesn't have a child for so long and yet doesn't have a second wife and doesn't have uh, a surrogate. And that's okay, right? That's what they do. That's the strength of their marriage. Maybe that's progress, right? Maybe, maybe the surrogate wife creates a poor family dynamic that is necessary, but perhaps is bypassed. Who knows? Again, I'm not willing to commit necessarily to that theory. Um, but it's an interesting one. And then you have the role of prayers, right? Yitzchak and Rivka pray, right? And we will see that next week's part or two weeks from now. Um, we have Hana praying. We have Rachel praying, right? So those are different things. The messenger of God forecasting a child, right? We have that with Avram and Sarah. 
We have that with Hagar, right? Hagar is told that she'll have a child. Mm -hmm. We have that with Manoah, which with Shimshon. We have that with Shunami. We sort of have that with Hannah. Not really, but we but you could count it maybe depending on what uh, what Ali promises her. Ali does tell her her request will be forgiven, right? So was, or, sorry, not forgiven, fulfilled. fulfilled. So yeah. So so maybe that is the case. Um, it's interesting, and in some of them, these children become like prominent. Shim sure. Shmuel, Shimshon, Yitzchak, um. Uh, Yosef. Yosef. Yo, Asia mm -hmm. Tsunami. We don't really know who her son is. Um, and then maybe again, that's part of. It, you don't have to be special to be able to be special, all right? Maybe that's part of the message. Um, and then there's also all this divine intervention. Um, uh, saving the child, protecting the child. Um, and, and then the question is why? Like, why is this important, right? Um, I think, Rabbi, you just said it, the importance of divine intervention in all of these stories. That is, the, you know, God's power. So that, I, th I think we touched on this last time, that's definitely important. The Radak, for example, very famously says in our Parsha, um, I'm sorry. Lodia kigam in imo to so that to tell to forecast that even with them with Avram and Yitzchak that God would do something great. Ahael tova dola great kindness a great good. She wasn't even able to give birth. Ki al nes because of uh, of a miracle. Right. This is based on a midrash that says. That uh, our matriarchs, that's they, they didn't even have a womb. That the baby was uh, and and, and doctic, What's it called? A pregnancy in the fallopian tube. Ecto ectopic ectopic. Pregnancy. Thank you. Um, that they didn't have a womb to help to 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 raise the baby, right? And why is all of this? Says the Radak, based on the Gemara in. Um, oh, so he said. The, well, just to take Renan's point before we get to the Gemara, right? That this is to highlight God's role in the world. That God, that that for people who are going to usher in an understanding of God in the world, like Abraham, like Yitzchak, like Yishma, like all that, that that the, even their birth is a, is a sign of God's eminence, God's power, God's involvement in the world. Which again, if we follow this line, that sort of it intensifies or de, de, or detensifies over uh, Jewish history. So the Isha Tsunami is the culmination of that. Not just great people need to show that God plays a role in the world, but even the regular Isha Tsunami, we don't know her name, we don't know her son's name, we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. They also are a testament to God's involvement in the world. They also carry that message. They also are a mm -hmm. product of that procedure, right? Mm -hmm. So so again, that, that's part of that. Says the... The Gemara in Yevamot, I'm a Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak taught, which I think is a funny name that's Rabbi Yitzchak who teaches this, because um, we're talking about someone who talks about that. Mm -hmm. Why does this happen? Melame to teach, Shekadosh Baruch Hu, mit ave, that God is, uh, 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 yearns for, desires, letfilatam shel tzadikim. To the prayers of the righteous people, i.e., the imaot and the avot, and that's why this happened, right? Again, I love the fact that it's Rabbi Yitzchak, um, but uh, but that that's part of it, and that's what the Radak says. I'm sorry, that's what the Radak quotes this, but that's what the Gemara in Yevamot uh, Samach Dalit notes. So part of this is also for the spiritual development of the parents. So that they should pray for God. To motive, they should pray to God. They should be motivated to reach out to God. Um, uh, the this is similar, um, and I don't recall if he says it exactly in this context. But Rav Sadia Gaon, who lived in um, during the Gaonic period, so let's say whatever before before. 
let's say 800, 700, 800. Mm -hmm. Usadi Gon says, this is the point of a test. A test is to grow, is to stretch the spiritual capacity of the tested, of the tested. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of it. Um, and says as Rav Sajagon that, uh, again, I'm not sure if this, this is uh, even necessary, but Rav Sajagon says, why is this the case? That earlier barrenness by the Imaot and by the Avot makes them love their children even more. Um, and Rosaja uses a test case for this that in four of the cases that we listed the love of a child to a parent is explicitly written in the Torah and Rosaja goes I don't understand do you think that the other children in the Torah weren't loved by their parents of course they were and therefore, it must be that the Torah is highlighting an even deeper connection that was born by these sort of circumstances. So that's what Rav Sajid says. Um, but all of this highlights um, this, this, this important motif, which again, ties perfectly back into our Torah. Um, and so I think that's part of this barrenness component. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and again, some of it is it's very textual, right? Uh, both of those are used by Abraham and by used by Isha Shunami. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we have, we have, the, it's literally the same word. And I'm pretty sure it's one of the only times it's really used in the Torah like that. Um, um, all right, let's go, let's go on. Everyone with me so far? So we talked about the barrenness and, and the different ways in yeah. it plays. Um, And then there's the other there's the other note here, which is as you read the Torah, at least according to some, Rav Hanan Samet makes this point very clearly, um, and others that were really watching Rav uh, Amnon Bazak, they were watching transition the shift in the leadership model of the of the of the messenger of the of the prophet. Um, Elisha doesn't have a lot of prophecies; he has lots of miracles. His go-to tool is miracles. Um, and that ultimately gets phased out, right? Yishayahu, Yirmiyahu don't do as many miracles. They do miracles, but they're miracles just to support what they're saying. They're not solving problems with miracles, right? They're not magically whisking right. away evil people or making oil appear out of nowhere to help the poor, right? They're in, they're conjoling the population to help the poor, right? So there's a difference here that happens. Um and that that becomes a big transition, and 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 I think if you re an honest reader almost imagines that Alicia doesn't know this, like Alicia misses that memo that prophecy, the nature of prophecy is changing, and so he gets caught right at the you know at the very end part of the story, um, uh, the you know Alicia sends dispatches Gehazi to go save the boy, and it doesn't work. And so Alicia needs to come. And not only does he need to uh does he need to do something, but he needs to pray. By Palel al Hashem, he prays to God. He uses prophecy not as miracles, but as God dialogue engagement with God, verse 33. Mm. It's the first mm. time someone prays to God in this narrative, right? It's only after Gehazi fails to resurrect the child. Um, and so we're really watching this big change that's undergoing in the type of prophecy and the nature of prophets in that time period. Um, and it's it's really cool to watch because it's more in what we imagine the prophet. The prophet is the Zechariah, Oria, uh, Yermiyahu, Yoel, Nahum, Chavakuk, right? These are all people who are giving ethical, religious prophecies and and mandates and speeches to the people. They're not saying, oh, there's poor in Jerusalem? I'm going to make a miracle, and tomorrow every poor is going to have a pot of gold, right? It's just not the way it works. Not the way it works. And maybe that was something that existed in Alicia's time, and it doesn't exist here. It seems like it is. Um, so, Rabbi, you said that, like, Isaiah... For example, also did miracles. Prophecy they do. 
right? Mm. The dry bones, right? and tell the wind to come and to right. animate the dry bones but but, but was, sorry that was just a vision what does that mean it's just a vision i mean you i'm referring to the fact that we're emphasizing the fact that there was this transition from doing miracles to to what we generally understood prophecy uh, to be did, did, what so there's a debate in the Talmud. What happened to the dry bones that Yechesko resurrected? The Gemara, at least three opinions in the Gemara there assume that it wasn't a vision. It was a rhetorical tool, right? God reanimates a part of the Jewish people and, and they're actually alive. And, yeah. uh, but the point is, as God continues and says, this is the Jewish people, don't worry. Even though you're going to exile, you will be redeemed. It's not solving a now problem. Uh, Amos, Amos does lots of miracles, right? Or or Yechezkel, uh, you know, talks about uh, you know some some miracles about things that are going to happen, but they're really just to highlight the fact that his prophecy is the case. If really he wanted to solve the problem of miracles and the poor wasn't being tended to properly, he couldn't magically have Slav fall or Mon fall by all the hungry, right? But that's not. It would be totally out of character because it's not appropriate. Um, Yechaskel does miracles, but they're not, they're not, uh, they're not to like solve issues. They're rhetorical tools. They're not like a tool. They're a tool of persuasion. They're not a tool of impact. All right. Why don't we stop here? Well, and, I just want to. Yeah. I, I just want to ask a question about the very end of the Torah. Is yeah. that supposed to be parallel to Yitzchak being saved at the Akeda when Alicia saves the boy? revives the boy is that supposed to be parallel is maybe yeah okay, maybe you said it before and i just missed it but i i i was wondering that as well yeah yeah um yeah it is parallel meaning he was saved and he yes. was saved he was, and right. having the hard carmel point into that does work okay um, I just have one suggestion. You don't have to follow it, of course. Yeah. But when you shift to doing a piece of